Hello everyone and welcome to my review of episode 5 from the second season of The Witcher Show on Netflix. If you've missed any of the previous reviews, you can have a look at the playlist in the description and also be warned that this video will be full of spoilers. Now before we begin, I would like to address the fact that I was wrong about something in my episode 4 review. Apparently, the scene of Kyr's execution was intended to take place in Aretuza, or somewhere around it, and not on Southern Hill. Now, I got confused for several reasons. First off, we saw the mages going to what looks like a ruin in which the monument was placed. So I thought we were looking at a building that was destroyed during the Battle of Sodden. Then, when Fringilla's uncle unveiled the monument, he actually said, let it stay on the hill forever or something along those lines. So naturally, I thought we were on Sodden Hill. And of course, in the books, that is where this monument is located. But apparently on Netflix, the kings took this monument to Aretuza first, or they built it there, only to then move it all the way to Sodden and leave it there forever. I think that's the explanation. Oh, and one more thing I'd like to address very quickly are some misconceptions about the removal of Geralt and Triss's romance. Some people seemed to think that I wanted to see a romance between them in Season 2. So, if I didn't make it clear in the video, let me try once again. According to the books, such a romance is not supposed to happen during the events of Season 2. It was instead something that took place in their past. And even if such a relationship is implied in the show, the point remains that the main purpose of their romance is no longer present. It's not simply a matter of whether or not they had sex in the past. Their brief relationship was what originally motivated a lot of Triss's actions and shaped her character. She was mildly obsessed with Geralt and it affected her interactions not just with him but also with Yennefer and even Ciri, which ultimately portrayed Triss in a not-so-favorable light. It gave many people a good reason to dislike her, but I thought it's also what made her interesting and memorable, in a way. And sadly, despite inserting Triss in Season 1, none of that is now in the show. But anyway, let's get to the actual episode. Yennefer and Dandelion are about to part ways, but suddenly someone breaks his loot, Yennefer notices that and decides to stay behind and save him. Those of you who have read the books likely have the right idea that the man behind it is no other than Ryan's. Or Rian's. And speaking of him, we go back in time a bit to establish how he got here. Apparently he was imprisoned by Calanthe and released by Lydia after her death. Lydia is of course Vilgefortz's assistant, and all that was so he can track down Ciri. One thing they don't really explain is how exactly Ryans managed to find Dandelion in Oxenfurt. The clue which Lydia gave him is that Ciri was last seen in a market near Sodden. My sources tell me she was last seen. Now this refers to the last couple of episodes from the previous season where she met this lady who couldn't pronounce Skellige properly. What's so special about Skellige? So with that piece of information alone, he was somehow able to find Dandelion. I guess he probably found the people who sheltered Ciri, who also saw Geralt taking her, and it is from them that he learned about the Witcher, and he probably heard Dandelion singing about him, and so he had him captured. Also, by the way, the song, Burn Butcher Burn, sounding in the background when Ryan's is shown, is a nice touch. Burn, 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 burn. So, let's talk about some of the changes to Ryan's and Lydia for a moment. Contrary to the people who say that I hate everything that's different from the books, I kind of like this so far. Lydia, especially, is a character who, in my opinion, deserves to be expanded upon, and Netflix seems to be trying to do just that. We'll have to wait and see how it goes in the next season, but so far, I'm on board with these two characters. Next up, we move to Geralt and Istrid, who team up and try to uncover the secret of the monolith. But before that, we learn that Istrid has gone rogue, and is now secretly helping Sintra. I think I may have skipped through that part in my previous reviews, but he was quite upset with the mages at Aratusa for how they treated Yennefer. So he decided to turn away from them and start helping the elves. Because, you know, he still loves Yennefer, and Yennefer is an elf. But I won't go into this again. Then suddenly, they get intercepted by two Nilfgaardians who apparently don't fancy Istrid very much, 
and our heroes are forced to neutralize them. We then go back to Yennefer, who is searching for Dandelion, and she employs the help of a local prostitute, who suggests that um, if you lose a man, you have to look for him in the last place you saw him or something. And so Yennefer returns to the tavern where Dandelion was singing last night. Now, is it really the best idea to tie up and torture Dandelion where he was singing only recently and literally make him scream in broad daylight? I mean, he is a powerful mage, according to Lydia. For a mage of your ability, it's criminal. Probably not afraid of the local law enforcement, but she did also say that this whole mission is sensitive stuff, so he should probably be a little more careful. Yennefer barges in, pretends to be drunk, and she stops swallowing her drink at just the right moment when Ryans decides to grab her, pin her to the wall and ignite his finger in her face so that she can blow out the alcohol through the fire and burn him. Now, this is a reference to the books where the two of them have a brief magical duel, once again over Dandelion, and she does burn his face with her own magic. However, on Netflix, it seems to be a little too contrived, is that the word? I mean, Yennefer did break through Kyer's chains with a massive axe at an impossible angle only recently, but I think this whole scene could have been easily improved by simply having Yennefer hearing Dandelion's screams and listening in for a moment. Maybe peeking through a crack in the door so she can see that the kidnapper is in fact a fire-wielding mage and so she could come up with the whole alcohol idea. But instead, she just barges in, has no idea what she's dealing with, and just manages to perfectly improvise the whole thing. I'm not really sold. So Ryans is wounded, Yennefer and Dandelion escape, but they're once again captured, this time because they were betrayed by the prostitute from earlier. Fuck. Well, Yennefer was, specifically, if you recall the wanted posters from the previous episode. So they capture her Get your fucking hands off me. and Yen decides to say the magic words which phase her into Baba Yaga's dimension. Fucking lucky. Fuck. And Yennefer is offered a contract. The old woman will give her what she most deeply desires, aka the restoration of her powers, and in return Yen will deliver Siri to her. In the previous video, I mentioned why the idea of sacrificing a child in favor of regaining her power goes against Yennefer's character, not just in the books, but in the show as well. And there is another issue, I think. Yennefer simply comes across as too powerful, even without magic. She easily deals with pretty much everything the story throws at her. She's a sword fighter, wields massive weapons with proficiency, casually escapes from all the kings and queens of the north, along with their prisoner, outfoxes Ryans, who has so far had two scenes, and in both, they made sure to tell us how powerful and special he is. Unless you're very talented. So it almost feels like Yennefer doesn't really need magic. Least of all that she's so desperate to have it again, that she's ready to go against what she truly wants the most, which is to have a child. By the way, you may have noticed that I skipped ahead to go through all of Yennefer's plot in this episode. Um, I might start doing that from now on, because we get a lot of cuts back and forth sometimes, and I don't want to keep saying, okay, back to this, back to that, moving on, and so on. And speaking of which, we're moving back to Istrid and Geralt, who continue working together. Now, this is quite the departure from the books where they were, in fact, the biggest of rivals. Yennefer was at one point in the past secretly in a relationship with both of them at the same time and when they found out, they were going to kill each other. And the story was more than a simple love triangle, it actually served to develop Yennefer's character later on, but given the changes in the previous season, there's no real way of implementing that story, so they had to do something else with his trit, and I must say I like how he's turned out to be. He's a bit of a nerd, and given that Henry Cavill is also one in real life, especially when it comes to The Witcher books and games, I think the two of them make a great couple. They also make sure to explain the distinction between the spheres merging into one and only interacting briefly during the conjunction. I think it's quite obvious for anyone who's familiar with the lore, but for new audiences it's a good piece of information. 
Also, Geralt finally learns that Yennefer is alive and that this is most likely the primary reason why Istrid is here. You know Yenna. Yen. As we suspected. Now, before we continue with the nerdy couple, we have to go back to Kea Morin and talk about Triss, Vesemir, Ciri and the Elder Blood. Oh boy, where do we begin? Are we going to talk about this? There's nothing to talk about. The hell there isn't. Okay, let's talk about the lore implications first, and then we'll get to what actually happens in the episode. This whole deal with Elder Blood being the main ingredient for making Witchers is a rather massive change from both the books and the games. If this was originally true, so much would have been different. It would have played a part all the way through the books from the earliest moments in the Sword of Destiny story where Geralt and Ciri meet Eithne, then all the way through the Kaer Morhen arc and later with the Lodge, and then through all the games until the very end where Avalach is studying Ciri's genes. All of this would have been impacted in one way or another, yet there are no mentions of Elder Blood being involved in the making of the Witchers. Ciri's blood, essentially, well, that of her ancestors, being involved in the making of Geralt. And I question this change because, given how massive it appears to be, it also seems to serve little purpose, at least for now. And I want to stress again that I'm not disliking it simply because it's different. I want this to be a good show, a good story, I'm passionate about it. Many of us book and game fans are, despite often being told that we're just a hateful bunch. After my previous review, for example, where I briefly mentioned this change, I got an email from one of my viewers and it's basically a whole essay trying to reconcile this Elder Blood and Witcher's bit with everything else. So yeah, people care. But anyway, what I think is even worse is that this change flies in the face of Netflix's own creation once again aka the Vesemir anime. Uh, when I started making these reviews, I had no idea that every single episode would somehow contradict Nightmare of the Wolf. But so far it seems to be the case, and I honestly can't wrap my mind around it. Many people just say, oh, the anime is simply not canon. But think about it. It is produced and written by the same people. It was released between parts 1 and 2 of their main story. And in many ways, it serves as backstory to part 2. You know, we have this ancient-looking witcher, Vesemir, appearing. Kaer Morhen being explored. Mutated monsters showing up. A whole bunch of witchers fighting them. And the anime makes an attempt to explain how all these things came to be. You know, who Vesemir was, how he became the man he is now, where mutated monsters come from, what went on in Kaer Morhen before it was sacked, how witchers were made, and so on and so forth. All of this was in the anime, and pretty much all of it has been disregarded in Season 2. So I I'm mildly shocked, really. In this case, specifically, it's the making of the witchers part. First, they showed how extensive, dangerous and complex the process is, and now Vesemir casually says how all he needs is a vial of Ciri's blood and he can make witchers for decades on. With a vial of your blood, we could protect generations to come. And what about the mutagenic mages? A whole secluded sect of sorcerers who alone understood the intricacies of the whole process. They literally made a point to say that if they die, the art of making witchers will be lost forever. If we die, there can be no more witches. And they do die, and Vesemir is the only one left, along with a handful of little witchers. But I guess it doesn't matter now, because Triss can simply say a few words over a vial, and it's all set. Did it work? It worked. You know, Triss, whom Season 1 made an effort to show as someone who's not very experienced? Remember how Tissaia was basically holding her hand at Sodden? But anyway, in addition to this, Vesemir is also shown in such a negative light during these events. He knows very well how dangerous the whole thing is, that Ciri is more likely to die than she is to survive, and he still agrees to do it. I mean, Geralt has just left to investigate the monoliths and find a way to help Ciri, and Vesemir decides to do all this, which will potentially lead to her death, 
behind his back. And also, if Ciri's blood is the only way to make witchers, why would Vesemir be in such a hurry to turn her into a witcher? Witchers can't have children, so, you know, her blood will end with her. So instead of looking for ways to make her a witcher, he should probably be looking for a husband or something. My father will ensure the right man is chosen. It's true that initially Vesemir sounds like he doesn't want to do it. Forget it. <coughs> for forget it! But Siri easily convinces him with a bunch of platitudes. I've destroyed so many things. And he agrees. As for why Siri is so willing to do it all of a sudden, well, it's two reasons as far as I understand. On one hand, she feels unworthy and weak, because Geralt didn't take her with him to investigate the monolith. However, nobody seems to be mentioning that this monolith is in Sintra, you know, the place where Siri ran away from, so why would he bring her there? And another reason is that she feels lost and betrayed and is now searching for a new truth in becoming a witcher, something along those lines. At the root of this is the fact that Ciri now blames Kalanthe for never telling her the truth about her origin. In fact, Vesemir made the implication that Kalanthe hated the elves precisely because she was part elf and was powerless to change that fact. But my grandmother, she hated the elves. Sometimes our deepest hate is for the things we cannot change about ourselves. But when I think of season 1, I can't recall anything which implied that Kalanthe hates the elves because she herself is part elf. In fact, I'm not even sure if Kalanthe in the show actually knew that Ciri is part elf, related to Lara Doran and so on. And if she had known, there was no indication of it. So ultimately Ciri gets injected, but right in time because Geralt returns and tells them to stop. And they stop, and that's all there is when it comes to turning her into a witcher. Now, another thing I would like to know is why Geralt acts as though he is perfectly aware of what's going on. I mean, here's the thing. If Vesemir shared with the other witchers the truth about Elder Blood and Fainwed, then they must have already known what Ciri is because they were the ones training with her and watching her bleed every day. So they must have seen the flowers, they must have known the truth, and they must have been hiding it from Vesemir. And as far as I can tell, there is no indication of that. Therefore, we are left with the alternative, which is that Vesemir kept this secret from the other witchers, in which case Geralt should be totally confused by this scene. When he walks in and Vesemir tells him that Ciri is meant to rebuild the witchers, Geralt? She's meant to be, to rebuild us. She is not. Geralt should be like, what the hell does that mean? But instead he appears to know exactly what's happening. Then, he and Ciri have a brief exchange, which is actually good. There's a lot of emotion in it, Geralt asks why she did it, and for once she gives a good reason. It's not the same thing she said to Triss and Vesemir, but instead she tells Geralt that she wants to be like him. And not just physically, but psychologically as well. You know, being able to shut down all her emotions and everything that's tormenting her on the inside and so on. Which actually makes sense, because she saw how he reacted to Yennefer's supposed death. Then Nivellen brought this up again. How are you not heartbroken? And even Dandelion, earlier in the episode, said that Geralt only grunts and has no friends, or something along those lines. So, I think this scene worked. It felt like they were trying to set up something throughout the season, and in a way, it paid off. Now, was it worth turning the lore upside down for this? Probably not, but I'll give it some praise where it's deserved. Also, I forgot to mention the whole thing Ciri did with Triss before the injection scene. The sorceress claimed that she can help Ciri find a new truth or something, and she took her into some kind of dream dimension. I'm not entirely sure how to describe it, but it's pretty cool. It allows me to enter the deepest layer of your consciousness and uncover things that may be hidden there. Genetic memories that tell the story of who you really are. It shows Emir and Pavetta suspecting that Ethelene's prophecy is about Ciri, 
and preparing to leave somewhere. Then Siri said that this happened right before they died and we'll have to wait until next season before we learn how Netflix portrays the events surrounding their death. But it's interesting. I'm curious to see who they'll blame for it, how they'll explain Emir's survival and so on. We also see Kair and Siri gets really scared of him. Don't be afraid. Now, I have to say that even though this is book accurate, it just doesn't work quite as well in the show as it did in the books. For a couple of reasons. First off, Siri here is older. In the Netflix lore, she's not that much older than she is in the books. Maybe a year or two? I'll have to double check. But the actress herself is even older than that. And it shows. Also on Netflix, Siri saw Kyer's face, as well as his ridiculous armor, and the audience even knows who he is. Meanwhile, in the books, Siri was a small child who was kidnapped amidst the burning city and all the chaos by a knight clad in full black plate who wore a winged helmet and to her little girl's mind he almost seemed like, like a phantom. And so she kept dreaming of him about how he's chasing her and tormenting her. And I'm not saying she's too old to be scared or anything like that, it's just that in my opinion, the books had it better. But anyway, Ciri's Witcher senses are highlighting some Feinwed, and she sees Lara Doran in her dying moments, holding her child. When I watched this for the first time, it was only here that I realized Nivellen was talking about her in the first episode. She is referred to as an elven warrior in the show, and she was a mage, so I guess my RPG and D&D loving mind simply couldn't comprehend that a mage is called a warrior, but perhaps she was multiclassing. So she grabs Triss by the neck and starts reciting Ithleen's prophecy, similar to what happened to Ciri that one time in season one. The time of the white chill and the white light is now. And then we see the wild hunt approaching. I think I already shared my theory about them being behind the newly mutated monsters, and I hope it turns out to be true. It could be interesting. It's possible that when Ciri unleashed her power, their mages, you know, the navigators, sensed this mini conjunction taking place, and that's how they noticed her for the first time, despite being worlds apart, and so they sent these monsters as scouts or something? But we'll have to wait and see. All in all, it's a pretty good sequence. I like it. It's you. You will destroy us all. I saw it. Oh, and I forgot to mention that the Dream Realm has a very Bulgarian-sounding name. Well, very Slavic-sounding, I suppose. And it fits other elder names, such as Dol Bothana. What Tris calls it is Dol Dusha, or Dol Dusha. It's called a Dol Dusha. Dusha is something the show lacks at times, but I hope they improve in that regard. Okay, I think all that's left in this episode is Kair's return to Sintra. We see that Dara has already arrived, and I can't help but feel like he's not the best infiltrator, simply because he sticks out too much amongst the crowd, especially with that hairstyle. But what I thought was quite interesting is that it almost seemed like they're trying to set up some kind of romance between Fringilla and Francesca. I've never had a partner before. It's not terrible. <laughs> My favorite type of magic, lesbomancy. Which I suppose is highly inappropriate given the fact that Francesca is about to give birth to what I assume is Philavandro's child, but there we have it. So tell me what you think of everything I talked about, and I thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my supporters and YouTube members, and until the next video, stay tuned and be good. The country, she says. Fresh air's what I need, she says. So we came out here. Anything for my bunny. Sets that is sucking air. She sucked off the postmaster in my plowing bed. I can't take it no more.